Our hope and prayer is that everyone that's gathered here today can say, it is well with my soul. I hope that you brought your Bibles with you. If you did, you can turn with me to Isaiah in chapter 55. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, this is, uh, if you will, many celebrate this as being Palm Sunday, the day in which Jesus made His triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Jesus is headed to the cross. He's headed there to be sacrificed on Calvary's tree, if you will, on the, the hill called Golgotha, so that you and I, through His blood, through the shedding of His blood, might receive redemption for our sins, that our, 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 our sins might be paid for. Isaiah in chapter 55 is a prophecy, if you will, that points us to the cross. It points us to Jesus' triumphal entry. Uh, now, keep in mind that this is prophetic. Uh, to some degree, it's prophetic. We, as we turn to Isaiah in chapter 55, we're going to read verses 1 through 7, but I want to pay particular attention to verse 4 at this, at this moment. It says, Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Verse 4 is, if you will, God's fulfillment of the promises to the house of David. This climaxed at the resurrection. It climaxed, if you will, at the cross, the death, the burial, but ultimately at the resurrection of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We find this prophecy being fulfilled. We find the door being opened, the way of salvation being made possible. We see, if you will, God's grace and His mercy exhibited physically not just spiritually, but physically on the cross. Now, as I said, we're going to read verses 1 through 7. So if you would, let's jump back to verse 1. In verse 1, I'm reading the King James Version this morning. It says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye by and eat. Yea, come by wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me, hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not. These shall run unto thee because the Lord of the Lord thy God, and for the Holy One of Israel. For he hath glorified ye. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon, his, upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Once again, let's bow together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that you exhibited for us the way of salvation when you allowed your son Jesus to die on the cross. And Lord, once again, we thank you for this day and for this opportunity to gather together to praise your name. And Lord, we pray that all here know you, that all here, Lord, are prepared to meet you. Lord, that their names will be found written in the Lamb's book of life when you return from your heavenly home to gather the saints together. Lord, we ask you to lead us and guide us this morning. Lord, let your word be spoken and your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are several things from this passage I want to point out to you uh, that, that spoke to my heart this week as I was preparing uh, for the message this morning. And uh, if you will, there, there are four things, if you will, in particular, and my wife has already gotten on to me this week for last week saying, if you will, too often. So y'all kind of bear with me, okay? I'm kind of new to this. Uh, I've been preaching now for about 23 years, and I still have my little quirks. Once again, as we look at the passages this morning, four things stand out to me that we find throughout the passages. 
First of all, we find our predicament in verse 1. Let me read that passage to you once again. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. It points us to our predicament in the sense that we see our need. Isaiah, back in the first chapter in verse 4, Isaiah said these words. He said, Ah, sinful nation. Now keep in mind the prophet Isaiah uh, is hearing this directly from God. He's recording it, if you will, for our sake. In verse 4 of chapter 1, he says, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. We find an example of this over in the New Testament in the book of Romans. Paul writes in Romans in chapter 3 and verse 23. He says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Isaiah, once again in the 64th chapter, and this seems to be the theme, all throughout the, the prophecy of Isaiah, the sinfulness and the iniquity of mankind. He says in Isaiah in 64 and 6, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Friend, let me tell you something today, that there is no greater need in this world that man has than to have his sin forgiven. The Bible, God's Word, points us to the fact that we are all guilty. It points us to the fact that we have a genuine spiritual need in our life. Verse 1 also points, it to, points us to the fact that there is a thirst and a hunger in this world for, the, for righteousness, for goodness, for salvation, for eternal life. Many people are going about it the own, their own way. They're going about it seeking uh, their own way, their own will, their own desires, and seeking salvation. Desiring. Many, many will tell you, well, you know that they believe that you get to heaven by simply doing good on this earth. But Isaiah makes it very clear for us that there, that there is a, if you will, a spiritual nature within ourselves that prevents us from gaining eternal life by our own power. If you're here today and you're thirsting and hungering for righteousness, and if you notice what Isaiah says in verse 1, or verse 2 rather, he says, Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? Let me paraphrase that if you'll allow me to this morning. Isaiah in South Arkansas terms is saying, Why are you doing something? Why are you attempting to gain something? that benefits you nothing at all. That bread that's spoken of in verse 2, John MacArthur says it's the bread of deceit, not the bread of life. The Gospel of John records for us Jesus' words in chapter 6 and verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Once again in the 18th verse of Isaiah in chapter 1, Isaiah writes these words, Come now, let us reason together saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. This speaks of all of those who come to Christ seeking forgiveness of sin and salvation, which means eternal life. So you see our predicament. We're here on this earth and we have a great 
great need that no earthly item can fill. We thirst and we hunger for unrighteousness, because, for righteousness because we are unrighteous. We're sinful by nature. What a predicament we find ourselves in. Secondly, this points us, if you will, to God's presence. Look with me once again in verses 1 and 2. It says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, and come, to the, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Verse 2, Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your, la your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me. And eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. This speaks of God's unendless supply. It speaks of His presence. It speaks of His door, which is always open for the person who cannot earn salvation upon, upon his own works or by his own power. Verse 1 tells us, it doesn't cost you anything. But let me remind you, it cost Christ His very life. His door is open. His supply is ample. Once again, the Gospel of John records Jesus' words. For you and I today, in John in chapter 10, verses 9 through 11, it says this, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Friend, there's an open door standing before you this very moment. We look at all of the events that are t unfolding before our very eyes, and everybody is questioning, what now? What shall we do? The first thing that we need to do is that we need to turn to the Lord. We read in 2 Chronicles Christian, let me tell you, it says these words, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, turn from their sins, and seek his face, my face, God's face, then I will hear from heaven. And I will heal their land. Christian, the greatest thing that you can do at this very moment in time is to go to the Lord in prayer. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer that you've never turned from your sins and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest thing that you can do today is to respond to His invitation to enter in through the door. To come to the shepherd. Thirdly, this passage speaks to us and it gives us God's perception, if you will. Look with me once again in verse 3 and 4. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you even the sure mercies of David, behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. If you would, jump with me down to verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. This points us to the fact that our Lord and our Savior is patiently waiting for you today. He's watching. He's listening with a very close ear. 
The Apostle Paul refers to God in, in Romans in chapter 15 as a God of patience. Today, he's patiently waiting and watching. He's inclined his ear to hear your repentant prayer. And he's opened the door and made the way for you to address him directly. You listen, you don't have to go through the preacher, you don't have to you don't have to go into the presence of God through the priest. But you can come to him today personally, privately, individually and be granted eternal life. Lastly, this passage in Isaiah points to our persuasion. I've already alluded to the fact that we're all sinners in need of a Savior. And that the only way to eternal life is to enter in through the door. The way made possible through Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. I'm reminded of the scripture passage that points to Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It said that people went before him laying palm branches down in his path and crying, Hosanna! Hosanna! The Lord in the highest. Verses 6 and 7. Give us instruction, if you will, to persuade us to do what righteousness, righteousness demands. Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Call ye upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. You know, this is probably one of the clearest Old Testament invitation to salvation that you will ever find. It promises salvation now and kingdom blessing later. Mankind's plans inevitably fall. They fail. But the Lord's plans are different. They're righteous. They're perfect. They're holy. And they're for our good. So what does the Scripture instruct us that we must do to inherit eternal life? Isaiah says that we are, first of all, to seek the Lord. That we're to seek the Lord. God speaks to us through His Holy Spirit. But we're to seek the Lord. We're to seek diligently with all of our hearts, with all of our being. Secondly, we're to call on Him while He is still available. You may disagree with this, but I believe that there may come a point in time in which God withdraws His Spirit. I've spoken to many older pastors, much uh, more, if you will, in perhaps intelligent and experienced than I am. Some have even pointed to the fact that perhaps God has removed His hand and withdrawn His Spirit from the New Testament church. Now, I, I won't go so far as to say that His Spirit is completely withdrawn. But I will, con I will confess to you that the number of people professing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and being baptized in general as a whole across the church has diminished significantly in the last 20 years. Fewer and fewer people are coming to know the Lord. 
But yet, let me point out, God is still working. The gospel is still being preached. The invitation is still being given to seek the Lord and to call on His name while He is near. But I also must point you to this. And this is a fact that we cannot deny. That a true seeking faith is always accompanied by repentance. Let me read verse 7 once again. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon What that means is that a person must come believing in God, recognizing his sin, desiring forgiveness and deliverance, at the same time recognizing and realizing his own inability to be righteous and casting himself upon God's mercy turning away from his sin. Matthew records for us the New Testament invitation of Jesus. In chapter 11 and verse 28, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Friend, if you're here this morning, you've never professed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you can't say with a certainty in your heart that when you die, you're going to heaven. The fact is, is that all of us are going to die. If the Lord tarries, there's not a one, one of us here that stands in this physical body that will not succumb to death. But just as the grave was not permanent in Jesus' instance, that He rose from the dead, you can have the assurance and the peace of knowing that you will be raised in the likeness of His resurrection to live eternally in His presence. If you seek the Lord while He is near. If you repent of your sins, believing that God is who He says He is, the King of all kings, the Lord of lords. If there's a decision that you need to make this morning, listen, I want to invite you you can meet with me individually on this parking lot. To my right, your left. I'll be glad to visit with you. You can call the office this week. Visit with some of the staff. And allow us to share with you more what it means to be saved. Will you do that? Christian friend, will you live a life that's holy? and righteous before the Lord. Will you do that? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for what you did on our behalf. Lord, let us do the least of all things that you require of us that we might be saved. As your Spirit calls, as it draws, let us seek you while you're near. We ask these things in the blessed 
precious name of Jesus. Amen.